Welcome to another episode of the Miles Offside Podcast, where we talk a little bit of football and a whole lot of nonsense. My name is Oscar Puente, also known as Footy From Afar, and with me, as always, are my co-hosts, Mr. 100% Chuck Bailey and super producer Ian Stimson. How's it going, boys? Oh, off. Uh, Palace uh, in beat in Man United. Uh, <laughs> guys, balls, don't give us any in credit. Uh, off. Oh, Zaha's has not a diver. Oh, we're gonna Europe <laughs> Palace on tour. Oh, damn! You beat me to it. I was gonna do the Chuck impression. <laughs> Sorry, mate. Uh, it's all good. We'll have plenty of that all we all uh, episode. Uh, if you uh, if you can't tell, Mister One Hundred Percent's One Hundred Percent record has been broken. We are flying sans Chuck this week. It is just me and the super producer. His beautiful, beautiful face. But we're going to do the same thing as always. We're going to go through the football. We're going to do some listener stuff. I think we have a little more listener stuff than usual, which is really nice. Um, always good to interact with the fans. Uh, if you are joining us for the first time this season, we are very happy to have you aboard. Welcome. There is usually Chuck a third isn't. person. He couldn't care less. Yeah. <laughs> he, couldn't, he couldn't even be bothered to turn up. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna. We gotta have Mr. Perfect attendance about this, you know. It's, it's, oh yeah, he's been happen. he's been bragging about it for way too long. It was just a matter of time, and boy, does it feel delightful. Um, yeah, if you are returning, thank you. We always love you guys coming back. Feel free to tell a friend, share with somebody. Although this episode probably won't be particularly representative because we're gonna sound like nice people for once, maybe. <laughs> We'll see. Oh, that's harsh. No, neither of us are, are nice people. <laughs> yeah. That's why Chuck likes us. Be accurate. Um, but we will kick things off, as we have done many times in past, and the big return for the first time this season with our... <clears throat> rapid, rapid, rapid fire news. Oh, that was a good one. Yeah, right? I leaned into the mic on that one. Yeah. Top story this evening. Luis Suarez. Police are probing his Italian citizenship <laughs> test. Italian <sighs> authorities are investigating alleged irregularities in Uruguayan footballer Luis Suarez's Italian citizenship test. The Barcelona striker took the exam last week as part of a possible move to Italian club Juventus. But... The prosecutor's office and the financial police say that they're looking into how the test took place. Judicial sources have told the Italian news agency that Suarez himself is not under investigation, only the test. Hmm. I mean, he is literally allergic to following the rules, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> like, of anything. You've, I mean, how much... Uh, this is Was this for, like, a passport test or, or something? Uh, it says it's his citizenship test. Citizenship, okay. Yeah. So, I mean... I can imagine all he needs is a a passable Italian, surely. I yeah, mean, it wouldn't have been that hard for someone with all the time in the world, you know, a lot of downtime, let's face it, to just learn some Italian. He doesn't even know how to conjugate verbs when he tries yeah, to so speak. He's just like presenting the base form of them and like, I it's a disaster. What, what an idiot. Uh, side question, what is conjugating verbs? Uh, that's a thing that we do in outside of England when you want to indicate the number of people and or the time frame in which an action is happening. Oh. I guess you guys don't have verbs over there? <laughs> no, no, no. I just, I, I'm terrible. I never, when fin Finley comes home from school and he's like 10 years old and they are talking about past participles and stuff and we just didn't learn that. Like, oh, okay. I thought you were joking. You actually don't know about verb tests. I don't really know about grammar <laughs> and English and my language. I'm I'm having to go at Suarez here. If I was to take an English citizenship test where I had to conjugate <laughs> verbs, and uh, and what does he say? Only uh, he only speaks using the infinitive. I'll probably do that. I've got no idea. <laughs> no idea. There are some really obscure verb tenses. I know, especially when I studied French, it was like there was one called the plus perfect, which is just like. Didn't make sense to my English-speaking brain even a little bit. That actually rings a bell. Like I did French as well, but I have no no knowledge of. I couldn't. I couldn't speak any French at all. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's basically like I am, he is, they are, right? Like the to be verb conjugates very strangely in most languages. But anyway, <laughs> Suarez, a cheater. Are you surprised? No, <laughs> not really. <laughs> oh man, his wife is Italian apparently, which makes him eligible his to apply for a Italian. passport. Yeah, his wife's Italian. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, Just learn some fuck... Oh, I mean, I can't talk. I can't even conjugate English verbs, but uh, that's unbelievable. I can't, I can't believe his wife's Italian. That's brilliant. And of course, it's Luis Suarez, too. Like, if, like, who else would it possibly be? 
Oh, so good. All right, let's keep moving with uh, our rapid fire news now that we had a lengthy conversation about verb tenses. Yeah, without Chuck, this could go long. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tottenham. Josie Mourinho says Gareth Bale's motivation is high. He is so happy to be with the club of his heart. He's so happy to play for us. When a player has this motivation many, many times, you can shorten the period of recovering and shorten the period of getting fit and ready to play. That's if he feels he can, he, if he feels ready to do it. He's an experienced player and he knows his body better than any of the sports science guys or any <laughs> medical guy. Yeah. And if he's ready to play, it's possible. Amazing. Um, his contempt for his own uh, physios and stuff was definitely uh, shown in all or nothing because like when they come over to tell him that Harry Kane's going to be out for minimum 12 weeks he's he sort of seems to blame them <laughs> yeah like, absolutely for fuck's yeah. sake <laughs> he's so angry it's very much like if we don't test then we don't have any cases kind of situation <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely like, well why did you scan him well <laughs> he could have carried on playing surely I mean yeah. probably and he has a long track record of feuding with physios and stuff like obviously there was the whole Ava Carnero thing at Chelsea, although that maybe had other kind of undertones to it. But that goes back to like at other clubs that he's been at too. Like he's well known for fucking hating science guys and medical guys. Yeah. And anything to do with injury. I mean, even John Terry said that when he was on the treatment table, he was basically just ignored. <laughs> it's just seems, uh, yeah, he really doesn't like injuries and injured players, does he? I mean, it's a sign of weakness, right? So <laughs> exactly. Yeah. If only people were motivated enough, we wouldn't even have any disease in the world, right? Like, just you just want to gotta want it bad enough. That's how it works. Same with um, coronavirus; it doesn't come out after ten p.m. Uh, so <laughs> That's right. Oh man, you guys are like going back into lockdown, basically. Oh, they don't want to call it that. Uh, oh, okay, they, okay. They, they don't want to call it. They're desperate not to call it that. Although, hopefully, the newspapers will. Uh, it, things are being tightened up a little bit. Let's just say that. Yeah. Speaking of, I guess that's a good place to transition to our next story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, plans for fans to return to sporting events in October, which was the original sort of time frame for that, has been called off. Prime Minister Boris Johnson has confirmed plans for fans to return will not go ahead. The plans were placed under review after a rise in coronavirus cases, and they're saying at least for the next six months, I believe, right, that it won't be well, that's happening? The, yeah, all of these rules that have been brought in, because um, that was, we're recording on Tuesday, and that announcement was made today, and the idea being that it will these rules will probably be in place for six months um i think that is and i'm not suggesting that this is the right thing to do but i think that is him managing expectations i think he wants to so we've got some other social things like you can only gather in groups of six right weddings are like less than 15 now or something Down to 15 yeah exactly i think what's go the the idea is though that he puts all this in place now so that like a week before christmas he can release it and be the prime minister who saved christmas ah. that's I, I think that's what they're going for that's what and he thinks might, yeah yeah i think there's a very good chance a week before christmas he just goes all bets are off let's go <laughs> <laughs> all, all stadiums are open we can do football and uh, yeah but it's um, it's saying six months is what we should be thinking about as time frame for these rules at the minute. Um, which, safety concerns aside, you can't do that, obviously, but yeah. is very worrying for lower league clubs. Um, yeah, so give me your, like, League One perspective on this, because are you worried about well, the posh? Is that, like, does it go further down than that? Or, like, where is the sort of cut off? Depend well, yeah, depending on how long this goes for, you could see championship clubs going under. Wow. Um, there, there are some championships. I mean, Peterborough aren't a particularly well attended club. Um, we only get sort of uh, attendances of about sort of six, seven thousand. You know, maybe a few, a bit more if we're doing particularly well. Mm. Um, but we're we've been well run for a long time. Um, we obviously just sold Ivan Tony for a lot of money, and I'm sort of quite glad that we haven't spent that money now because we might need it as a as a buffer you know yeah but Macclesfield Town have already gone under just last week now admittedly there was some mismanagement along with that but it yeah. can't help that obviously you're not getting gate receipts which is your main income if you're a small club I think it's a it's a very real worry for League One and below and obviously I am putting safety concerns aside but I'm just thinking about jobs and community clubs going under it could it could be a, it could be pretty disastrous to be honest Obviously, you would rather lose clubs than like human lives. Of course. So if that's yeah. like a safety concern. But when you say go under, 
what what does that mean? What does that look like? Is that the same thing as going into administration? Are these clubs no. like just not even going to exist ever again? When like- you go into when you go into administration, you've got a chance because uh, basically uh, you're bringing in a third party who will run the club and do their best to both pay the people you owe, mm-hmm. but keep the business going. As a going right, concern, right, right, right. that's the idea. Now that it's not good because you very often have to let a lot of staff go uh, to bring your wage bill down. So as you can pay people what you owe, you often have to sell off assets, yeah, uh, and things like that. And certainly, clubs that go into administration very often then go under, as in go, get liquidated and just no longer exist. Right. But yeah, administration is a chance because you might be able to pay off some of those debts. You might be able to negotiate better payment deals or whatever but it is it's that that's why there's a points um deduction attached to going into administration because it's not good it shows you've not been yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. well run you know but no it, but but i mean clubs being liquidated like uh as happened to maxfield town so maxfield town had uh, half a million pound of debts now that's not just down to covid obviously that's it there's you know maxfield town fans would tell you there's been mismanagement of their club for a while but it doesn't help that you've not got the gate receipts. So, yeah, I think I don't know what happens. If you start getting a serious amount of teams going under, I don't know how you sort of – I know, I know we joke about uh, you disliking the pyramid, but I don't know yeah, how yeah, we yeah. sort of save the structure. You know, I don't know whether Premier Leagues have to start putting B teams in to replace, you know, uh, or reserve teams to replace the sort of teams in League One and Two and stuff, which has been talked about in the past anyway. Right, and I know other countries like Barcelona B just basically wins the second division every year, right, but they're not okay. allowed to get promoted because Barcelona A is in there. Oh, right, okay, well, so, they, like, yeah, that's definitely a thing in other countries. I think this extends further up the table, though. Like already, we've seen a lot of clubs being very, very hesitant to spend money that they otherwise would normally be spending in the summer. Yeah, it's, it's ha- having an effect, definitely. Yeah, and I think that now that this like six months thing just came out, or however long it might be, it might be less, it might be more. Like, but as of now, the official number is six months. I would imagine like a lot of clubs are going to be willing to sell players for less money than they otherwise would have because they just need that cash on hand. Yeah. And clubs like Liverpool, who had to make their Tiago deal like for what, five million up front, and then they just agreed to an installment plan basically because they didn't have the cash. Like that's going to really have a significant effect on like the contracts for the next few years. Yeah. Definitely. At the top level, even. Yeah, absolutely. Even, yeah. Like you say, even at the top level, they're going to have to start uh, cutting their cloth accordingly because. We last week there were pilots of having like uh, one thousand fans in some lower league stadiums. I think there was about seven or eight games that did that. The Premier League was banking on this. I mean, they've released a statement today saying how sort of disappointed they are and that they can make things secure and and blah blah blah, and that they're going to be pushing for fans to be in as soon as possible. But it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen for the time. For the time being, anyway. Like I say, there's a part of me thinks that Christmas might, they might try and release things a little bit, but whether it'd go as far as sporting events, I, I don't know. Yeah, the Boxing Day matches are going to be like full stadium, just like everybody's <laughs> like, just so excited to yeah, be back. Part of me does just think he really just wants that, like, you know, riding in with a Santa suit and just letting everyone just do whatever, <laughs> but I don't know. It would feel gross, though. Like, I still remember watching that Liverpool match versus Atletico, was it? Yeah. Right? Oh, like, gotcha. the day before everything shut down. Yeah. And being like, wow, this is a fucking terrible idea. Why are all these people in the stadium? I'm not comfortable with this. I, like, I sort of said about how we... Like so, I I have backed up podcasts that I listen to uh, that aren't topical, and they go in months back because I've been listening to because I've been scaring myself shitless listening to coronavirus news and, uh, <laughs> you know, and but and sporting podcasts now that's been back as well. But um, like I've got podcasts stretching back to January sort of thing, and I was like, I wonder when I'm first going to hear mention of the coronavirus and stuff in old podcasts, and I didn't start hearing it until like February, and it was. 23rd of March when we locked down but I'd still remember that seeping into the media the the uh, Liverpool Madrid game as what the fuck are they doing like Spain it was in the news that it was going crazy with coronavirus and yet yeah of course yeah because yeah, yeah. Spain and Germany went way early yeah yeah and it was just insane so you know it's not it's not beyond our government to do insane things where sporting <laughs> events are concerned so who knows maybe it's on yeah. All right. Well, speaking of coronavirus, let's keep moving after 12 minutes of that specific story. <laughs> Rapid fire to the next one. A German football team lost 37-0 to their local rivals after fielding only seven players who socially distanced throughout the match. 
The opponents had come into contact in the previous game with someone who had tested positive for COVID-19. Their team tested negative, but the other team felt the conditions were not safe, so they only fielded their seven players. Seven brave volunteers. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I volunteers tribute. No. <laughs> <laughs> but then, yeah, just what? Walked off the field? Yeah, no, they just lost the 37-0, but it was to avoid a $200 fine. Like, would you rather just pay the $200 or 200 pounds than, than lose 37 Yeah, German 200 euros. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you'd just club together, wouldn't you? And just take... Yeah, just, just go halves <laughs> on it. get a 3-0 loss rather than a 37 The goal difference is just shocking. Yeah, that's, they're, they're fucked. <laughs> they're 11th division. They can't afford to be losing 37 <laughs> the other The other team, I, I feel like... On the one hand, they should have maybe just won eight or nine nil. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just the nine. Even, well, I don't know. Nine nil has happened recently in the Premier League in a competitive game. So I just sort of thought sure. hey, that's a sort of you know. But if you're gonna go all out, why only thirty <laughs> seven? Like, like, surely it was kick off. Well, did did the team with only seven did they kick off? I don't know. Well, you don't have to have two people to kick off anymore, right? No, That's true. Not the rule, so you so. Just boot it. You just boot it to whatever direction. Thirty seven's disappointing. Didn't want it enough. I mean, I, I like that's when you go on FIFA and just set it to like 20 minute halves <laughs> on super easy yeah. and just see how many you can score. <laughs> like, yeah. Fucking 37. I, I didn't look up the stats line, but did someone have like 15 goals in that? Like you imagine, imagine having those guys on fantasy that week. Like fucking A. <laughs> what was the XG on that? Um, yeah. I don't know. There was a quote as well. So like, oh, the other team didn't, the other team didn't know what was going on or something. It's like, I mean, you could have shouted to them. We're, we're scared of Corona. <laughs> <laughs> all right what okay. are you like three minutes into the match and they're all clearly like staying really far away from everyone and not running like oh i wonder what that's about yeah. <laughs> in these times um oh. but i mean this is obviously i think i think i read something like this is the 11th tier of german football but it does yeah. sort of the further down you get obviously the less money there is for testing and stuff and as i said we're recording on tuesday and tonight there's a cup game or there was down to be a cup game, Leighton Orient versus Tottenham. And lower down, you don't necessarily... Uh, like, the testing is less regular than the Premier League. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, I think the Premier League clubs are paying to test the lower division players yeah. before these matches so that they don't, like... Yeah. And it was a big it was a big reason why uh, League One and Two voted to curtail the season, because they couldn't afford the testing. They thought well, they would need to keep it safe. Oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah, well, that, that was the reason given, really. It was just to keep Peter Brown out of promotion. Obviously, we all know that. Uh, but yeah. um, but Tottenham paid for Leighton Orient to be tested. Four or five of their team tested positive. I know. Imagine if they hadn't paid for that. If, exactly. Like, if they hadn't done that, that's how it gets into the Premier League. Absolutely. Yeah. They shouldn't be fucking doing these, like... Who of course the fuck they cares about the League Cup? Or is it, like, a money thing? Is this, like, a way to get money for the lower clubs? Is that why? Well, maybe, but, like... Like and I was brushing aside safety concerns earlier to talk about sort of lower league clubs and stuff, and I I am seen on this podcast as being the traditionalist out of all of us, possibly because of my hideous age. But <laughs> it's it is ridiculous to play these competitions. Like it's great that they've managed to get the Premier League going in a seemingly sort of COVID secure way. But yeah, the addition of of the League Cup. They're still playing the fucking EFL trophy. I mean, luckily, Peter Brown, Tim Pot Cup, didn't want it anyway. But, like, <laughs> actually, is that the one we're in? No, that's the one we're in. We're out of the Carabao. Oh, that's, that's the big one, then. Fuck Sorry, the that's FA the one Cup. we want. Yeah. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. <laughs> the one that only League One and Two are in, yeah. Um, but why are they playing the, these extra matches? I mean, Tottenham don't need an extra match in their schedule, and now they're going to have to play it down the way somewhere. No, assume. and, like, Lampard today said that because of the way that they're organizing the coronavirus sort of measures the protective measures the youth squad is playing separate from the a squad or the, the like senior squad right um which means that he said like normally i would be running some kids out because who the fuck cares about the league cup it's the middle of the week we're trying to, we're still basically having a preseason type of like whatever and he was yeah. like i can't use my youth kids who i would normally give a chance in this type of match because they're isolating separately from the senior squad so it would make like a whole it would be a whole thing basically yeah, I mean, I hadn't even thought about that, but it's yeah, that, to put the ancillary competitions on is just it's just ridiculous. Yeah, like maybe the FA Cup, I get because like especially over there, tradition, the magic of the cup, blah yeah, blah blah, whatever. Like, but like, we're all dealing with a lot of abnormal situations. You know? Yeah, <laughs> just get rid. What do you mean? <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, seriously, it just seems bizarre. I agree. I think it's dumb. Uh, let's move on then to our last story. I'm not avoiding it. For those of you who are screaming, being like, how are you doing news? How are you doing news? You're so biased, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Roman Abramovich apparently had secret stakes in rival players, according to Finn Sen. I don't know who that is, but uh, he had secret investments in footballers not owned by his club through some shell corporations, some third party corporations, including a Peruvian winger who played against us in the Champions League in 2014. Um, it should be noted, though, that that's not against any rules. So I don't really see why this is like being reported as a big deal. It's shady as fuck. Very clearly very shady. But it's not against the rules. So I don't know that like other... I think, I think in some um, leagues it's against the rules. But I think in the competitions that it happened, I don't think it was. But right. yeah, it's it's all it's all very... It's not great. But at the same time, it sounds like... What makes it look less great is the number of shell companies that are involved. Yeah, 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 yeah. of course. But <laughs> that's know, all his want... money. Like, he's, you know... <laughs> well, yeah, true. He that, is who he is. is. Like, you know... <laughs> yeah, the guy's got a lot of shell companies. Yeah. I should say allegedly. <laughs> um, yeah, well, if Panorama are going with it, I'm happy to. That's the BBC's investigative journalism programme. Yeah, so. that's true, that's true. Yeah, I'm fairly, I'm fairly happy. <laughs> I don't think he's going to come after Miles Offside. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's a regular listener, so... <laughs> yeah. he, he emails me all the time. I've never told you guys that. No, no, you haven't. Oh, yeah. But yeah, all the, all the sort of all of that aside, it seems to me like these basically just seem like investments where they're he's buying a portion of economic rights for the player, be it right um, for their you know whatever sponsorship deals they do or whatever, or to get a sort of part of the sell on clause. And unless he's sort of directly advising the player, but even even so, if he was to directly advise the player to do something differently against a team the player wouldn't necessarily have to do that the, the, no of course not it just seems it seems like a shady investment thing to do but i don't Absolutely. think there's anything massive that we have to worry about about integrity of the game i don't think but no yeah. i mean that i you know i kind of agree with you i have like sort of three thoughts in response to this first of all it's fucking Roman Abramovich. We know he's shady. Why is anyone surprised by this? Like, yeah. Color me Allegedly, shocked. when the Soviet Union collapsed, they allegedly were like, who wants this oil? And he was like, I might have something to say about that. And took all the oil in Russia, allegedly. And like, very, very, very shadily made all of his many, many billions of dollars. Like, it's Roman Abramovich. Who cares? <laughs> we know this. This is not news. That's These one. known facts. Yeah. yeah. Two, I do, it's not against the rules. So like, why are we like... Roman Abramovich has sandwich. Aren't you so shocked and appalled? Like, bro, it's not against the rules. Who fight? Like, why are you reporting this? And three, obviously, I don't know anything about this whatsoever, but I'm not assuming that other owners aren't also doing this if it's not against the rules. All of the owners are fucking shady people who only care about <laughs> well, money. Yeah, that's that much has been shown. Yeah. So if it's not <laughs> against the rules, like, are we really assuming that no one else does this? Really, it's just Roman. I don't know if that's the case or not. But I just, yeah. like, come on, come on. Yeah. Really? Are we clutching our pearls <laughs> <Come on. laughs> at some shell corporations? Come on. <laughs> yeah, good. All right. That, uh, that'll that do it for Rapid Fire News, a half hour in. Although after you edit it, it might be closer to 20, but we'll see. Uh, which means that it's time to talk about the fixtures. Shall we just go in chronological order? Yeah, why not? All right. Everton 5, West Brom 2. 4.2 to 0.3 on XG, so West Brom wildly overperforming to their two goals. I don't have anything interesting to say about this other than, wow, how Mr. Rodriguez looks good for Everton. Yeah, well, ev everyone uh, in their midfield who they've uh, got looks good. And uh, Dominic Calvert-Lewin playing like an absolute poacher, exactly like what you want for a, a number nine. And he's 23 too, so like it makes sense that he would start developing more and more facets to his game, seeing the game a little faster. Um, he's at that age where you sort of start to make the, the turn if you're going to, and he might well be. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're seeing this sort of uh, post-lockdown, Everton didn't have a lot to play for and it showed. But pre-lockdown, pre his his numbers were great in the league, you know. Um, so I've, I've got some XG, but the XG over the two games for uh, Calvert-Lewin is 2.68 and he scored four. Uh, whereas, wow. his X, whereas his XA... His expected assists is 0.06. I mean, that is proper centre forward territory, isn't it? Yeah, he it is, really is. He's just getting on the end of everything else and making sure it goes in. Sometimes to Richarlison's annoyance, but it was, <laughs> uh, it was, yeah, it was, it was a. I mean, the only thing I would say is that it wasn't. 
open and shut for Everton until Gibbs got sent off. And yeah. then the second half. And then they really sort of showed their dominance. Everton's a weird one. And this isn't an original take. Um, I know the, the double pivot guys have talked about this. I've seen it on the Atlantic. The athletic. I always make that mistake. <laughs> um, because they invested a bunch of money on players in peak age as opposed to like 24, 25 about to go into peak age. Mm. And usually that means that a team is like aggressively pushing for – a Champions League spot if normally they're like a fifth, sixth place team or a yeah. title if they're a second, third place team. Like they're hoping that this injection will lead to success this year, not five years down the line. Very much a Tiago at Liverpool, right? Like they bought yeah. a 29 year old, 28, 29 year old. It's like, that's not a, that's not a buy for the future. That's a buy for this season. Let's make a move. Right. And, but the question is like, why the fuck did Everton do that? Why would they go so hard at this year? They have almost no chance of making top four. And do they really want the Europa League that bad? Like, I don't see why they did it, but it's working. Like, they, they look really good because they spent a bunch of money on good players who are in the right age to do well now. And it's paid off. But, like, what's the end game there? Like, what's the, well, the what, to what end? I hadn't thought of it like that. The, the only reason I think of that immediately springs to mind would be that maybe they're scared that a coach like Ancelotti won't stay there mm. unless they are you know, pushing for the sort of top four, basically. Let's face it, Everton have always wanted to be there but never done it, or certainly not in the um, recent history anyway. Yeah, been well um, over a decade, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, ma- ma- that's off the top of my head, that's possibly the only thing I can think of that they're worried that he would, would if they got a sort of ninth place finish, would say, what am I doing here? You know, I yeah, don't... that makes sense to me. It is weird that he's there in the first place. <laughs> like, yeah, it's still a bit odd. Carlo, isn't it? what are you doing, man? Like, <laughs> Everton, really? Does he think he's at Liverpool, the other side, the wrong like team? <laughs> just didn't tell him. Yeah, just nobody told him. Yeah, um, Carlo, we've got a Scouse Club on the phone. They're really interested. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I can't think of any other reason. So that's as good as any. But but it's paying off. They invested. They look good. So uh, moving on to a club that would be fucking appalled to hear that someone won 37-0 is Leeds. They would definitely have kicked it into their own net a few times. Leeds for <laughs> full ham three. Leeds in another 4-3 match. Yep. And again, way overperforming their XG. They put up 1.5 and scored four. Fulham put up 1.6 and scored three. So it probably should have been a 1-1 one, one draw, 2-1 <laughs> win for Fulham. And instead, Leeds got a 4-3. What is going on with Leeds? I have no idea, but uh, um, they're not going to c- continue scoring the this average of three point five goals a game because, as you say, <laughs> their xG uh, is what one. I've got one point seven two for the two games, so it's nowhere near the seven yeah. goals they've scored. I mean, that's insane. Um, Patrick Bamford scored twice, and he's got an xG of zero point one seven. So does that confirm Chuck's thing that he's shit or that he's good? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't really know which way that goes. Bamford's super weird too because like, so, oh man, I wish I remembered the name, but someone tagged me in a post that they did looking at a bunch of XG and comparing it to actual goals and seeing what's actually more like predictive and useful and et cetera. And it basically they found that like it's almost, it's very, very, very hard statistically to be able to say with any confidence if someone is either a good finisher or a bad finisher, right? Basically, 99% of soccer players in the world are statistically average finishers. At the level and they're it, supposed to be, yeah. Right, okay. and it matters a lot more what positions they're getting in and what kind of shots they take, right? right. And then you've put that in there with a little bit of luck, and you're going to have a good striker, right? And so there are only a handful of players that you can like really confidently say vary from XG in a way that you're like, oh, that is about their finishing over this big enough sample size, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, they are Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo overperform XG because they are actually measurably good finishers. Mm-hmm. And Patrick Bamford Fuck off. is That's a amazing. measurably terrible finisher over many years of oh, his terrible. career. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. he gets amazing shots. He puts up fantastic <laughs> XG numbers. Oh, I thought we were going like, to go the other way. And just cannot convert. <laughs> like it's, and it's like not just, probably not just luck because it's been so long now. So for right. him to score two in this is just like perfect. Oh, I mean, he's already risen in price in FPL. I mean, this is, Chuck's just railing against this. It's been like, what are you all doing? You know, so it sounds like he's <laughs> right then. It, you know, the, the, this is just luck. But I mean, Bielsa, who is a manager who is 
obsessed with tactics and, you know, how things happen in football, he has said, we're not creating enough, which sounds ridiculous when you scored seven games, <laughs> seven goals in two wrong. games. But he's not wrong. Yeah, exactly. He's got it absolutely right that they're not... They're not creating enough. Now, they've got three points out of two games, so it's a decent start for a newly promoted team. Um, And one of those two games was against the fucking champions. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So, you know, it's a good enough start, but yeah, they're going to need to uh, create more because you'd have expected maybe more XG against Fulham, who... You know, are the worst defense in the league by a wide margin. (laughs) Everyone is saying, what the hell are they doing in the Premier League? So, yeah, yeah. Should have been Brentford. Should have been Brentford. Leeds are a weird one, too. I think that's something to keep an eye on as we go. I don't want to linger too much on them. We'll get to the Palace match in a second because mm-hmm. Chuck's already screaming, why aren't you talking about it? Yeah, why aren't you talking about story. it? <laughs> um, but Leeds is definitely a weird one to keep an eye on because they're – my gut and the eye test, again, statistically we can't prove anything, but like my gut says that there's something there that is going to make it so that they structurally vary from XG – consistently basically like liverpool last year right there's like reasons to think yes liverpool wildly overperformed but there are reasons to think that the way that they structure themselves will lead to at least some overperformance yeah and i wonder if leads are going to fall into that category certainly something to keep an eye on as we go through the season well we've talked about liverpool's uh analytical team and then you've got a coach like bielsa who absolutely drinks that shit he loves it so yeah. yeah, maybe. I mean, I've certainly I've got them down on the predictor league. Not that we should worry about what I've got in the predictor league, but I'm pretty sure I've got Leeds <laughs> in the in the top half. I th- I think they're going to be comfortably safe. Comfortably. Yeah, I think there's I put a lot tenth, of teams. Maybe. Yeah, I think I've got them similar. The I think there's a lot of teams worse than them. Yeah, speaking of teams worse than them, we have Crystal Palace <laughs> somehow oh. pulling off a miracle win against Manchester United. <laughs> Gut punch. <laughs> oh, I'm looking at the wrong XG here. Wait a minute. Crystal Palace pulled off a deserved win against Manchester United. <laughs> there you go, Chuck. You'll get the credit here, mate. <laughs> yeah. 1.1 to 1.9 on XG and Palace winning 3 to 1. Manchester United losing their first match of the season at home against a team that most people, including pundits and in our predictor league, had likely to get relegated. Ian, do you have any hot takes about this match? Nothing particularly. I mean, I feel like Chuck's quite righteous in his indignation that uh, the media generally are talking more about how bad Man United were rather than how good Palace were. They were they, good. They were really good. They were they were quick and sharp and there's a lot of people saying, oh, Man United... Sorry, not people, Man United fans, uh, saying that they... <laughs> <laughs> they're not people. Um, so, saying that... <laughs> Saying that, um, you know, they didn't, they had one pre season friendly or whatever, but it's like, well, that's sort of self imposed. Like, I know the Premier League said you, you can have your month break in games, but I mean, you could have said to your players, you're only allowed one week off and then we're going to get some games. You know, it sort of feels like that's a pretty poor excuse for being when you talk about squad value, comparative squad value of Man United and Crystal Palace, a bit oh, of forget a, about it, you know, and a bit of ring rustiness should not be causing that. Palace were quick to close down. They were excellent at closing down uh, Man United's like passing channels. Just mm. the second Man United tried to release the ball, it was like uh, MacArthur or McCarthy was there. Like It was just... Yeah, it was, it, Crystal Palace were really impressive. I think Chuck's got a genuine axe to grind with uh, the media just talking about how bad Man United works. That's just not fair. I agree with everything you said. Uh, I'll take sort of the Man United side of it, just to sort of have a more interesting conversation here. That really here. is Red Devil's advocate, yeah. Yeah, as gross as this feels. You, when <laughs> I saw the lineup and Juan Bissaka wasn't in there, mm. I immediately was like, uh-oh, they're going to attack the left, up the left a lot. And that's where all of their joy came from. Like, they were just going in. Because when you lose the best one-on-one defender in the league, like, that's going to have a knock-on effect on your ability to... First of all, defend, obviously, but also create because you're not stopping. You're kind of penned back, well, yeah, penned but, back. And also in front of um, Fosu Mensah, who was playing in, in place of wan they played Daniel James. Yeah, what was that about? Well, I mean, I assume it's to punish Greenwood for the, the misdemeanor. What misdemeanor? It might be more serious than that, I don't know. But the thing he did while he was away on England duty, you know. Um, did you hear about that? Yeah, yeah, he like broke quarantine to have a we party. We did, I can say, we did cover that. Him. <laughs> Yeah, okay, fine. We um, haven't done news, so we didn't cover that. Yeah, maybe we didn't cover <laughs> I'm sure it, it's yeah. come up. <laughs> okay, well, the assumption is that he's been punished for that. Um, but, I mean, I'll be surprised if Daniel James gets played in a 
any sort of competitive Man United game for a while because they were not good down that right hand side. And you can forgive um, Fossi Mensa a little bit because like he's the understudy or whatever. But Daniel James was supposed to be competing for that place, and it's just, it wasn't good. Yeah, and I mean it's one match, so like let's not read too much into it for United, but. It did seem like not a fluke. It seemed like a structural thing. The moment Juan Bissaka was out, like Palace knew where to go and it worked. It wasn't a fluke. So like, no. if your defense, and this is fucking hilarious for a Chelsea fan to be saying, if your defense is so reliant on like <laughs> one person being out, it's just going to destroy you. Like, <laughs> yeah. that's not a great sign, you know? No, no. So, I mean, do we need to worry about, do, well, we don't worry, obviously, but do they need to worry about, uh, the transfer window closing and maybe not having the money to spend. Uh, no way! They're like the richest fucking club well, in no, the world. Well, no, but by struggling, what I mean is they're paying so much money to the owners. And that oh, just seems... Well. The Glazer situation in the mainstream media seems to have gone away. But, like, they're, something came out that they're paying... Uh, they paid 89 million quid to the Glazers in share dividends over five years. Plus 120 million quid in interest on the loan that the Glazers took out to buy the club and then put onto the club. I mean, that's 200 million over five years. When, if you look at Abramovich, he must have put in, oh, three, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, 300 million or whatever over that five. I don't know. Like he would have put in a lot of money, you know, a lot. Yeah. And, yeah. and whereas the Glazers are taken out of the club, and that must cause a structural problem. I know what you're saying. Obviously, Man United, especially in the Far East, and that have got just huge selling power. Um, and and make a huge amount of money, but still, it's like that's two hundred million over five years. You could have been spending on players. Yeah, if I was a United fan, I would be livid that yeah. they're taking money out of the club. Like, I get that these are business owners and it's an investment and blah blah blah. But like, please, soccer clubs have never been about profit. It's about being able to show off to your rich friends. Like, look, I own this club. Isn't this so cool? Look, we won trophies. Like. If you're in it to make money, invest in a fucking steel factory. Like, what do you? <laughs> yeah, you know you what don't I mean. Like, football, it's yeah. way more profitable than a man, than a fucking football club. Like, absolutely, yeah. And they have infinite money. They could out be outspending Chelsea right now if they wanted to. Okay, That's it's not a lack of funds. It's straight up a lack of like, I don't know, desire. It's a conscious choice, and it's fucking weird. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it is. Uh, what did you think about the Palace penalty and um, it being retaken and them changing taker? Yeah, uh, that seems like it should be against the rules, but it's not, so whatever. Is it, yeah, that's <laughs> the thing. It's it's not. And I, I almost feel like... I don't so, mind the retake for the VAR, I guess I should say, right? Because like, if you decided yeah. that's the rule, it was always the rule, you're going to enforce it, that... VAR once again continues to just show how stupid the rules are. <laughs> yeah. Like that I think like I feel like that's the purpose of VAR at this point. It's just like, look how broken all the rules are. <laughs> um so that's fine, but I feel like on a retake you shouldn't be allowed to switch takers. But then like so De Gea, no matter how far, whether it was half an inch or a foot, he is off the line. He's the one who's broken the rules. Is it fair that you enforce the same penalty taker to take the penalty when you've probably got a psychological disadvantage because the keeper has one well in this case sort of saved it but probably no you know he's just seen the way you've gone i don't know it it feels like to me that the advantage should be with the attacking side in that case and they can do what they like but i know what you mean it feels like it should just reset to how it was but i'm sort of glad that palace were able to change because it was a terrible penalty the first one it was a terrible penalty (laughs) so i was sort of quite glad that palace were able to change it and and gain, gain an advantage you know but like you say, it's not in the rules, so, it's, you know. Yeah, it's, it's exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. The rules are rules. Yeah. Like, I'm not going <laughs> to... Maybe the rules should get changed on basically every possible issue, <laughs> looks like. Thanks, Var. But if they're not, like, yeah. you know. I mean, whether it's a penalty in the first place is questionable. <laughs> um, I feel like on Chuck's behalf, one of us should complain about Roy not using the attacking new signings and just running the same lineup over and over again. Yeah. Chuck was pretty fucking angry about that for the most of that match until... They were winning. <laughs> <laughs> it does feel surprising they're not using uh, Batshuayi and... Um, Eze. Eze, yeah. It does, feel, it does feel a little odd. Maybe he's just waiting to, like, bed them in and give them time with the club. But, like, I don't know, man. That feels weird. That's, that feels off. And, like, he's always been so hesitant to change anything. And, well, is he going to change it after a 3-1 win against Man United? I mean, yeah, that's true. Yeah. 
All right, let's keep going then. That's that's more than enough about Crystal Palace, I think. <laughs> we did our due diligence. Chuck won't be so furious, so let's move on to Arsenal 2, West Ham 1. Arsenal 1.3 to West Ham's 2.1, so the scoreline kind of switched there. Um, but not so unbelievably extraordinarily away from the XG that I'm, like, shocked and appalled. I don't really have many takes on Arsenal. I think they're a mid-table club, and they're doing pretty well, but, like, they're still going to be a mid-table club. Yeah, you've not seen anything that changes that. No, uh, I think if anything, I'm more worried about Lacazette. Yeah. Um, I was talking to Adam, our good friend Adam, former punching bag of the pod. And former? You've been promoted, Adam. Well, Jeff is around now, so. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Jeff, we love you. Keep being a Patreon. Um, God. And we're, apparently there's rumors of an Arsenal-Chelsea, like, swap, but no one knows who the players involved are. And so me and Adam just spent, like, an hour just talking and being like, who the fuck is this swap for? He suggested Lacazette for Conte. And I just fucking laughed. I was like, you psycho. Like, <laughs> in what world would that ever be the thing that's happening? But I was like, is Lacazette even good anymore? Or is he like past it? Like, what's his deal? As an Arsenal fan, like, remove your bias and tell me what you think yeah. of Lacazette. Because obviously Aubameyang is still like really good. He might regress a little bit, but like he's still doing the job and he was like oh no 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 Lacazette is like truly past it oh right okay um, and if that's the case like they've overperformed because of him and Aubameyang for years now and if he's done and Aubameyang is the age that he is and they all of a sudden start to regress a little bit I better hope Nketiah gets up to speed pretty quick then yeah William too like is helpful but yeah I still think they're just a mid-table club speaking of mid-table clubs that you shouldn't be impressed by but apparently people seem to be for some reason. It is Southampton 2, Tottenham 0, 2.3 to 2.3 on XG. In fact, to the second decimal place, 2.28 to 2.28. I've never seen XG that close. Okay. Uh, Tottenham obviously pulling off a 5-2 win there. Um, Jose Mourinho after the match, interrupting Sun's <laughs> post-match interview to yes. basically be like, fuck you, Kane should have been man of the match, you suck. <laughs> So bad. What the hell was that? I don't know what he's thinking there. Just comes. It's almost like comes out just checking. You're not giving him man of the match here because you know Harry Kane. So as he can do another one of his inspirational team talks on uh, all or nothing. Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, yeah, three points. Yeah. Oh, three points. Fucking three points. Come on. Well, it's a cup game. It's a cup game. Uh, next round. Come on. Fucking <laughs> bizarre. Jesus Christ. But anyway. Uh, that's just something else to beat Harry Kane with his <laughs> inspirational team talks. Did they? What did you think of their performance? Obviously, they overperformed to a five-two win, but they didn't look bad. They looked the best they've looked in a while, I think. Well, it, what did uh, you make of Kane and Son kind of doing their business there? Well, the problem is uh, that it's hard to assess them because this was a story of Southampton's bizarre choices and. Well, not so much bizarre choices, but continuing with their playing their ridiculously high line when it was clear that it had been sussed out incredibly quickly. So, I mean, maybe I should give Spurs some credit in that, you know, Kane and Son specifically realised how high up they were playing and they weren't fit enough to... It didn't look like to me that they were fit enough to play that high line. No, not at all. And it was just like really dangerous counterattack after dangerous counterattack. Like, yeah, and and it was almost like they were like, I can't believe this keeps working. Like, let's just let's just keep doing it. So I feel like Spurs need to be given some credit for that. Yeah, but, yeah. I was surprised that the XG wasn't a clear victory for Spurs because it looked like one. But it yeah. was one of those like classic Mourinho matches where it's just like we created four chances, took four shots, and we scored seven goals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know what I mean? Quite, yeah. Um, but I mean, I've always been pretty impressed by um, Hasenhudel have to say his name like that. I can't say it any other way. Um, sure, of course. But, but um, I, I pulled a stat on this, actually. he's Since he took over, no Premier League team has lost more points from a winning position than Southampton. Wow. And that sort of shows a, a lack of being able to change when things are... Either when things are going right and you're looking to defend that, or when things are going wrong, identifying it and sorting it out immediately. Uh, it just seems a bit worrying that Southampton can be undone. Uh, so easily uh, yeah. when they did quite well post lockdown, but it it does seem like they've got one plan when they go into a game, and if it doesn't work, they can be seriously in trouble. Nine nils aside, but they, they can be <laughs> they can be seriously in trouble. I don't I don't know where to put Southampton. I I really don't. 
It's they made a good purchase with Walker Peters, but he seems to no be defending. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. I, don't, I really don't know what I think of Southampton at the minute. I think they're just the mid-table club. Like they're not going to be in relegation danger. No, no. I'd be very surprised if they were. And I also don't think they're with that bunch of like five clubs that might make Europa League, basically fifth through tenth. Yeah. Um, they're just below that, but like. Yeah, this is the thing with the the Premier League, though. You say they're just below that, and I think you're probably right. But it feels like the gulf between them and a Wolves, who five years ago, were sort of ping-ponging between Premier League and Championship, you know. Yeah. The gulf that's opened up there is seemingly massive. Yeah, they just... Southampton need to buy all the Portuguese players and then they'll be fine. (laughs) Clearly. Yeah. Clearly. Um, To come back to the Tottenham side of things, how... Watching that and knowing that obviously they just announced Gareth Bale, didn't put that in the news because we would come up... It would come up during the Tottenham match anyway. How do you feel they're going to integrate... Bale with Son and Kane already in there. Like Son and Kane were playing pretty well off each other. Yeah. But they'd have to change the system, I think, to be able to put Bale in there. So like what even happens? Certainly from what they were playing against Southampton, I mean they were basically playing Son and Kane up top as a two. Yeah. Um I think if you're Lucas Mori, you're probably worried about your place. Oh. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> See you later. Um But I mean we've talked about obviously how Kane has been dropping deeper and deeper now it it worked pretty well this time because he was just pinging balls over to Sun. so you know it was working really, really nice well. passes too i have to give him credit for his passing yeah absolutely um with i must admit if you're if you're if you're going to be playing a front three of of bale kane and son it feels like you've got a really flexible front three there that will you know if they can if they can gel that 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 could work very very well the problem is of course bale's got to get back up to Premier League speed pretty sure. fucking quickly. He also hasn't been a wide player since a long time. Like, it, yeah. he was for a couple of years after he left Spurs and at Madrid, but he moved inside to play basically a sort of striker hybrid-ish position. And Son isn't a wide player either, so like 4-3-3... I don't know. I just think that, that one of those three guys is going to have to play somewhere that they don't like, slash out yeah. of position, slash can they convince Kane to play as a false 10 so to speak. Well, I mean, he might be naturally sort of doing that more anyway. But yeah, I, I think you're. I guess you're right. Actually, if you play a four three three, it's going to be a narrow one, isn't it? Yeah, it'd be real narrow. I have a sneaky, super hot take that I am hesitant to say out loud. But Chuck's not here, so I feel safe. <laughs> um, and that is that I think maybe I were not worry. That's not the right word because fuck Spurs. But maybe Sun is kind of on the way out. I haven't really heard anyone else talking about this, but. Bale and Son want to play in similar positions, and all of a sudden Mourinho's going out of his way to be like, "Son, you suck. We like Bale a lot. We like uh, <laughs> you think this Kane is the a lot start more." Of like, Jose like alienating one of his massive players, like he often yeah, does. Yeah, I mean, just Deli Ali's already maybe on the way to PSG, right? Even though that was clearly the teacher's pet in the Spurs documentary, like that was his boy. PSG is that the rumor? That's the rumor, yeah. So, like, I don't know. I don't know. Something in my gut says, like, let's keep an eye out for some Sun stories in the next couple of weeks. Because I don't know that him and Mourinho are necessarily getting along. He's one that, like, gets injured and then actually listens to the doctors. Can you believe that? (laughs) God, that's impossible to know whether Bale is an upgrade over Sun as well. Because he's just not played. Ah, yeah. Well, I guess we never talked about this. Is Bale a good pickup for them? (laughs) Question mark? I mean, I think so. I... uh... It's it's so hard to tell because he's just been frozen out so much. So, and he's and he's old now. Yeah, those are bad years to not be staying fresh. Like yes, I mean yeah. If 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 it's taken, it's if age has taken more than its usual toll because he hasn't been regularly playing at a top level. Then Spurs fans might be in for disappointment. But part of me just hopes it comes off just from the romanticism of someone sort of coming back to a club where they seriously made their name. Sorry, Southampton. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I feel like he's better than what I've got now because I think he takes Lucas Moura's place. But like, yeah, you've got me thinking about formations now and just how he fits in. It's maybe not as cut and dry as that. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird. Other than obviously the sentimental reasons, which is probably mm. enough. Yeah. Because what are they actually competing for anyway? Like to be honest, they're not going to win the league. They're not going to make the Champions League probably. So like, might yeah. as well make your fans happy. There's a there's a reasonable argument around that. 
I, I've never been so confused by a transfer. Is it a good transfer? Is it a bad transfer? He's old, but he's super talented. He, they're getting him for pretty cheap. What can he even do? Any like I don't, I'm all over the place. I have no fucking clue. Right. Gonna... We don't have to make predictions. It's fine. Yeah, I mean, I picked him up for my Fantrex team, so hopefully oh, did you? <laughs> he does a, a little bit of something. I don't know. That's a perfect one for draft, though, surely. Yeah, 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 because he'll just... He's literally, I turned my fifth midfielder into Gareth Bale. Like, Beautiful, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> even if he rides the bench and sucks, he's my fifth mid. Like, ah, oh, champagne problems. Anyway, <laughs> Brighton 3, Newcastle 0. Fuck Brighton, we're not going to talk about that. Uh, which brings us to <laughs> Chelsea 0, Liverpool 2. Chelsea 0.9 to Liverpool's 2.7. It's the thing that everyone wants to hear about. I'll kind of get out of your out of the way and let you have your take first, because obviously I have many thoughts on this, but I kind of I can bounce off of the things that you said, and it'll help me okay. sort of focus a little bit. <laughs> My main thing about this game is um, irritation on two points. the uh, The red card spoiled what was going to be a great game and a real mm. good tester to see where Chelsea are at when we've been talking about. Obviously, now they've spent some money. Is there going to be the push into the top two or even for title? You know, you you put them at the predicted eager second, me and Chuck both had them at third. So it was a, a nice early tester of that, and that got taken away by the red card. Uh, and the other sort of irritating thing is that this game didn't come a little bit later in the season because mm. Chelsea are still obviously bedding in uh, their players. That's fair enough, their new players. Because of the red card, Havertz got taken off early, so he loses another opportunity to sort of, you know, try and uh, get himself up to speed. And you've still got Kepper in goal, which Ugh. you will not have, hopefully, as early as next week. Don't know why you played him in, against Liverpool. Like, uh, <laughs> just, it you should know. have been Willie. There's, there's been a lot of, like, Lampard out type shit on Twitter. It's been a very toxic week for the Chelsea community on Twitter. Right. I mean, that's And ridiculous. I'm like, you idiots, yeah. shut up. Like... <laughs> Lampard not out, but I do think that he can he did make mistakes in his selection there. Yeah. Um and I and Kepa is the most obviously notable one. The moment I saw the lineup, I was like, "Oh, fuck." Right. My prediction of us beating Liverpool last week is going to look real <laughs> fucking dumb in a couple hours. I think the thing is Lampard to me feels like someone who's um got a pretty high level of emotional intelligence can you know socially can deal with people very well so i feel like maybe there's something there's a million things he knows that i don't but you know maybe, <laughs> maybe there's some, something that he knows that i don't that led to him picking kepper because he was perfectly happy to drop him last season uh, the back end of last season yeah so i i don't know maybe he thought i've got to try and show some confidence but everyone knows you're in for another keeper in the transfer market. Right. So, and the, What's, you know... What, it, t- what was the point of playing him? I don't know either. And of, of fucking course, like, his... Like, ugh. He, he just... Fuck Kepa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lost for words at how fucking annoying he is as a player. Like, I'm sure he's a lovely human being, and I wish him nothing but happiness in his life, and blah, blah, blah. And I do feel bad because, like, he's very clearly... Like, just going through a fucking terrible time right now. It's shades of Joe Hart back, you know, a few years ago or whatever. But yeah, yeah. That being said, like, get the fuck out of here. Why are you... Oh, he's so bad. And of course, of course he made a huge blunder for a goal. Was there any other way? It's a, it was a massively high-pressure situation to throw him into uh, <sighs> when he's already having trouble. And I just don't think there's any need for it. Big Willie's a big game player, you know. <laughs> He's done it before, so why why worry about it? You know, throw him in there; it's fine. Uh, because I mean, Chuck said on the on, on the WhatsApp, um, Christensen doesn't make that decision with a keeper he trusts behind it. I mean, it was a strange decision to go in with your forearms, <laughs> sort of like yeah, just a rugby tackle, anyway. just a classic rugby tackle. <laughs> Very odd, anyway. But he doesn't panic if he's not got Kepper behind him. Or even more than that, they clearly had no idea where Mane was. Yeah. On that counter attack, like I don't think Christensen knew that like he was in such a dangerous position and gonna get into such a dangerous place. And like, give him a fucking shout, Keppa. Let somebody know. Like you're the one that can see everyone. Give someone a fucking heads up. Like. Yeah. But no, that was frustrating. 
It was mostly just, I just mostly found it sort of disappointing that we didn't get the spectacle we could have got. I agree. And I think the first half, like, looked like it it was pretty even in the first half. Yeah. Like, we didn't, we were creating really dangerous situations and then just barely not getting off a shot. So the XG didn't look great at halftime. Um, And I do think that's going to be a structural thing with Chelsea. Just look at how many times Timo Werner's offside. Like, we're going to make dangerous situations that don't necessarily end in a shot. And so I do think that we have a decent chance of like overperforming XG this year, kind of like Liverpool did last year. But there was so much space behind Liverpool. Yeah. And Kai and Timo were linking up. And just like in the first match, they were just looking for Timo Werner and the space behind whatever defense, whether it was Brighton or now Liverpool, and just, just immediately playing him in. And the idea of Christian Pulisic being the one <laughs> on the receiving end of those through balls on the left wing... And Timo Werner instead being charging up the middle, ready to pounce on a rebound or get a get a pass in and get a shot off. Like even obviously having Pulisic and Ziyech and all of the defenders not available, like was a huge blow to Chelsea. I really did when I said we were going to win. I really did just assume that Pulisic was going to be in. I really didn't think that Kepa would be in goal. Like that's part of where that came from. But even just Pulisic in there to have a another speedy dude involved in those counterattacks. Like, I think we could have fucking won that match. And obviously that's easy to say because it's a hypothetical and blah, blah, blah. But that match was there. That match was there for Chelsea. And we have been dead even with Liverpool a bunch of times in the last 13 months. Like, it was fucking there for the taking. And then, of course, the red card and the missed penalty and the Kepa thing. Like, we, I think we were pretty lucky to get out of there just 2-0 despite the XG. The XG kind of has it at 3-1. I saw a lot of people on Twitter and on podcasts. I listened to the Totally Football Show this morning just so I would have something to bounce off of, like, their bad takes. And be like, okay, what stupid things did those guys say? How can I fix it with, like, being, you know, knowing numbers and, like, stuff? Um, And they were all like, oh, I don't know if Lampard knows how to get the most out of Kai Havertz. I don't know if, like, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's playing players out of position. I'm like, bro, six starters are missing. Of course he's playing players out of position. Like... I'm pretty sure that he has a decent idea of what it's going to look like when everyone's healthy. And I don't think that's going to be Kai Havertz playing at right wing. Like, we're playing people out of position to try to plug holes and get the best out of half a squad. Half a starting 11, I should say. Right? And so our our defensive line has yet to have a new person in it. It's Kepa and the same four fucking defenders as last year. So, of course, our defense looks bad. And, you know, they're playing... Normally, it would be Pulisic and Ziyech on the wings and Havertz at the 10. They're playing Mount and Havertz at the wings or playing Timo out on the wings because, like, like he's scrambling to, like, figure something out. Yeah, and I have a fundamental problem with the idea that Frank not might not know how to coach an attacking midfielder. <laughs> yeah, also that, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, from my side of it, from the, like, emotional fan side of it, I'm trying very hard to be patient. I'm not concerned for Chelsea. I think that, like I said, a lot of guys are missing. We didn't have a preseason. Frank has sort of talked about that. None of those are excuses, but they are are reasons. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm not concerned, but it is really hard to be patient when we came into the season with so much like, we're going to fucking dominate everyone this year. Like, let's fucking do this. And I still think that they're like, they could get... In the title run, like they could be at least in the conversation, right? If they stay good throughout the season, it's, it is going to take some time. And so I keep reminding myself of that, especially with the guys out that are out. Um, apparently Chilwell and Thiago Silva are available for tomorrow for the League Cup. And he said that Pulisic and Ziyech are not far away for potentially this weekend or at least the match after that. They're both in full training again, um, which was nice to see on Pulisic's Instagram. Him and Ziyech are buddying up, which is always great. But I'm not, I don't think te- that Frank doesn't know where to put the players. I don't think that he doesn't have an idea of a tactical system. Everyone's like, what is he doing? He's just, he's just throwing shit at the wall. Like, he's doing that to scramble because we're missing people. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But I'm not, I'm not concerned. I'm, it sucked. It fucking sucked to lose to Liverpool, especially the way that it happened. But, you know, that's kind of where we're at, I guess. Yeah. We were robbed of a good match there. Oh, man. It looked even in the first half. It could have been a really <laughs> good match. It really could have, but. It is what it is. Uh, we have Leicester. Cue the jingle. Oh, they're better than they ought to be. Burnley of the week. 
doing the Burnley of the week to Burnley. That's right, Burnley got Burnley'd by Leicester. We had 0.99 to 1.52 on XG. Leicester scoring 4 off 0.99 XG. Not a bad day for them. Um, but does this change our opinion of Leicester in any way? Leicester for the title. It's exactly the same as happened before. They're overperforming. <laughs> yeah, Leicester for the title. Oh boy. Will, you, will we still get 5,000 to 1 on that? Probably not. <laughs> no, probably. They'll never give those out that <laughs> No again. bookies will ever, ever give those odds again. <laughs> no. Um, does this change your opinion of Leicester, or are we just kind of in the same place? I'm in the same place, so I don't know that we need to talk about this match, but I figure... Yeah, no, I, I don't think there's anything hugely interesting. I, I'm not not sold. I'm not back on the Leicester train yet. So, yeah, let's just see how, see how it plays out. It, it's been a couple of uh, overperforming games for them, uh, yeah. be it through two penalties or through just overperforming XG. But, who knows, overperforming XG is what Leicester do. All right, well, let's keep going then to the Monday matches. Aston Villa 1, Sheffield 0. Boring match. No one generated more than 1.0 XG. I'm assuming you don't want to talk about that one. I don't want to talk about that one. <laughs> no interest. All right, good. And that brings us to the first match of the season for the best team in England for three seasons in a row. And that is Manchester City 3, Wolverhampton Wanderers 1, Manchester City 2.1 to Wolves is 0.7 on XG. So a solid Solid performance from City, well-deserved on their 3-1 win. They looked fucking spectacular that first half especially. It looked like it could have been a real dicking. And then Wolves kind of played themselves back into it on the counterattack, but ultimately City were just way too good for them. Yeah, they, you're absolutely right. The first first half, completely dominant. I think at one point it was 85% possession Man City, and it wasn't just ball-holding possession. They were moving it about really oh, well. Yeah. They looked incredibly sharp. You compare them to sort of uh, Man United, who looked so rusty and and not not at the races at all. Man City looked ready to go immediately. It was just like I when I saw the sort of first ten minutes, I I was like, oh, this could this could get really quite bad for Wolves, and they're a yeah. good team. Like I was sort of a bit worried for them. Um, but like you say, yeah, the second half they they got back into it. Um, I think they they suffer slightly from having um, Traore at uh, right wing back. He's he's just not just from not naturally being a defender, you know. Yeah. Um, I think I think sometimes he just gets slightly caught out. Luckily, he can run back like a fucking train, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> but like, he does sometimes get caught out a little bit. But they're they're looking to sign someone. Um, Semedo, or I don't know how you, how you pronounce it, but anyway, they're looking to sign someone in that position, and that means Traore should be able to go back forward and compete. Uh, for one of the front three spots. So uh, that might not last too long. But um, yeah, I think the big story, I guess, is is just Man City. Now they just clicked straight back into it. KDB looked amazing. It just Ugh, so yeah. good. And in a number 10 role, like, they sort of pushed him further forward than he played. On yeah, that Alfred's was interesting. Season. We should comment that they had two defensive mids, like actual defensive mids in there. Yeah. With Fernandinho playing back at defensive mid when he's been playing at center back for a while. And Rodri coming in. That... I who was it? I think it might have been Kaylee. Someone on Twitter was like, "This sure." Oh no, I think it was Grace Robertson. Probably Grace. Someone was like, "This sure does look like a lineup where all of a sudden this morning, Ilkay Gundogan wasn't available because he has coronavirus. Let's just find someone else to plug in." But I think that like that's just kind of what City do, man. It almost doesn't matter who's in the fucking lineup. They just do what City do, and they're so so good in attack. Like you said, they were parked in Wolves' final third. And, like, let's not forget, this fucking team scored 102 goals and generated 102 XG. <laughs> like, are you fucking kidding me? They're so good. And they just immediately were right back in it. Like, I don't know. They scare the shit out of me. Yeah, absolutely. They, they, if they continue like that, they're going to be absolutely dominant. But, it, you know, it, it was one game, so I'm not going to get overexcited. But the fact they just hit the ground running. Yeah, and, and like you say, you're, you're absolutely right when you talk about you don't ever see a Man City lineup get announced at two o'clock on a Saturday and look at it and go, "Oh, that looks a bit iffy." It doesn't matter who they've got in there. You always go, "Fucking hell, the other team's in for it," you know. And that's just how it feels all the time. Um, I, I think it was to just talk about Wolves for a second. They they acquitted themselves quite well in the second half. I really really like that. Um, Daniel Pedence just looks great. Um, mm -hmm. Lovely nutmeg on KDB for <laughs> to then get his assist. Yeah, I but and I think Wolves are gonna are gonna be a really solid team this year. Um, 
but they just come across Man City. And I think that's going to be the story for a lot of teams this year. They just came across Man City. And yeah, they got... just, just kind of assume that you're not getting those points unless you're really lucky and yeah. move on with the season. Um, speaking of moving on, that's more than enough football for this week. God, I'm <laughs> tired. Uh, let's get to uh, second half stuff. What do you want to start with? Okay, well, let's let's kick off the second half uh, with FPL because I wouldn't want Chuck to think that just because he's not here, I'm not going to give him the credit of... Uh, narrowly beating me in the head-to-head this week. I had a crushing victory on him the first week. Crushing. Um, but this week he beat me by four points. I had a, I had a rough week. Uh, 49 points. Nothing seemed to go right for me this week. Um, Oof, rough week for a lot of people, I think. Yeah, it did, it did seem like that. It was, um, what's the word? Feast or famine, wasn't it? Yeah, you exactly. either had yeah, Son yeah. and Kane or you didn't. Yeah, and for Chuck, his big one was Hammers. Straight into the team, putting yeah. up 12 points for him. That's a big good move. That's a big one. Yeah, really good move. I mean, everyone in the world seems to captain Aubameyang, so there's nothing nothing really much to say there. But yeah, it was just slim pickings. Uh, Mitrovic got a couple, which is nice. Mitro for golden boot, right? Yeah, well, exactly, yeah. He's two from two. I mean, the form's there. <laughs> I had t- uh, two, two free transfers coming into this week, and I've already taken a hit. Uh, I've taken the sort of option of doing what they, you know, what they call a mini wildcard when you've got two free transfers, but you make three moves because it really does change your team. Like, so I've gone, um, like like last night I, after the match, I went, um, a Bamiang and St. Maximan to, uh, KDB and, uh, Pedence for Wolves because I was so impressed at what I saw from both of them. Sure. Um, and then tonight I've gone, um, Greenwood. I think he'll still get man starts for Man United, but I've gone to Greenwood to Rodriguez as well before the price rise because I think that just I think that's a hit that will pay off. And Chuck moved very quick on Rodriguez there, and I think it's a good move. So it's it's not a blocking move, although it does seem like a blocking move. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but um, but it, I think he I think he looks so creative in Everton's mis- midfield that I've I've uh, yeah I've gone for the hit, which is so unlike me so early, but. There you go. I'm really happy with how my team looks. So I've got to say, good, good. That's where the stats robots are at too. We have we have two free transfers. The model has been screaming at me from game week one. Why don't you have KDB in the team? Why don't you have yeah. KDB in the team? It was like even with the blank, you should have KDB in the team. <laughs> so our chance is going to be KDB and someone else. And so the the choice is going to be about who the someone else is. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's going to be where we're at. Keep an eye out on the Twitter for that poll. But we're definitely getting KDB in, and it's going to be KDB plus someone. Um, we have quite a few people to get rid of. <laughs> the model coming into the season did, doesn't know about position changes, and it doesn't partic- – I like, I tried to use a bit of XG and XA to give a rough estimate of the value of new players coming into the league. Yeah. But the model is essentially built off of fantasy points, so if you didn't have fantasy points last year, then – yeah. That's not going to come in. So as the season goes on and we get more and more data, we'll be able to put in those sort of new transfers like James. Because he is something that he is someone that I would normally want. But obviously we're going just off of the stats and just off of the spreadsheet. So. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. But get KDB and he is by far the number one person that the model is like, why the fuck don't you have KDB? Everyone should have KDB. So. Uh, just number 10 in that team and on penalties. Oh, just so good. I should so plug good. the fixture raider also because we have that as a Patreon benefit for the people at the stats robot level um just to give out a tiny little morsel of interesting information for the fixture raider i did update it for game weeks three through seven and believe it or not the team with the best next five fixtures is chelsea <laughs> oh okay. One Chelsea. west brom crystal palace southampton man united and burnley um so invest in some chelsea attack if you don't have team of Werner, might be the time but this is the thing like i i would i would it Absolutely agree with that. 100% I'd agree with you. But Werner might be about to drop in price. So just wait until the end of the week before you do that because you might be able to get him point one cheaper. I think it's ridiculous. that You've got West Brom next, haven't you? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, what the fuck are people thinking? I mean, Werner looks good. He's had six shots over the two games and five of them have been in the box. I mean, that's where you want your striker taking shots he looks sharp the only thing Werner hasn't had is the service and once that clicks like you say you've got players coming back once that clicks you'll be laughing absolutely and the moment Pulisic is in the lineup the model also obviously loves him because price yeah um and points per minute which is what it's, it's basically a stuff point for 90 and his points for 90 is like through the roof 
Yeah. Um, so the moment he's healthy, the model's going to be screaming at me to get him in. Uh, and that the sooner that can happen, the better, because their fixtures are our fixtures. Their fixtures, <laughs> Chelsea's fixtures, look so good. So we do have a model that I built based off of XG that rates the upcoming fixtures both for attack and defense and overall strength of schedule for the next five weeks. And if you have interest in that, it's patreon.com slash milesoffside. Miles offside right? pod. Miles offside pod <laughs> at email.com. <laughs> but yeah, check out the various levels that are there because even if the there is our lowest level is $2 a month and that'll get you on the slack and there's lots of good FPL chat going on there. It's always kicking off. Well, at least there's FPL chat. Good. There, there is good FPL. There's better players than us. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly better players than me. I hate FPL. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair enough you you come at purely from a stats thing and uh it's it's helpful but uh yeah you don't love the fpl any, anymore <laughs> I, I never have i'm so glad to not have a personal team anymore like fuck fpl <laughs> uh, you've been freed yeah exactly but yeah patreon.com slash miles outside pod uh lots of different levels you can get involved on there um uh, we should also briefly briefly touch on the predictor league uh i'm not going to do a song for it because it feels like covering the Beatles. The um, Predictor no, League. Do League of Predictions where you send us a spreadsheet and we put in some teams oh, and then no. some of you get it right and some no. of you get it wrong. Sometimes a child is in first place and sometimes one of us wins and one year I came in last. Chuck, did you hear what I said? I said it's like covering the Beatles and then he just went and did it anyway. It just, oh, it okay. <laughs> when I find myself in times of anyway, trouble I only want to mention Mary it. comes to me <laughs> Speaking <laughs> words of wisdom, <laughs> let it be. I, uh, we copyright. We, uh, Chuck's always the one who does the music analysis. <laughs> <laughs> um, I only wanted to mention it because Finney will get a kick out of it because he's currently top. <laughs> Um, maybe because his team's nearest the alphabetical list. I don't know. <laughs> He's currently <laughs> top. So that's the only reason I wanted to mention it. It doesn't shake out properly yet. Um, Oscar, you're 30th out of 33. Uh, but yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> you know. Keep it like, time. Like it, it, it doesn't matter until you get about eight game weeks in, but well done, Finley. He'll, he'll listen and get a kick out of that. Right, so let's do uh, listener questions because, believe it or not, we've got some listeners and they interact with us sometimes because they're real people, not uh, other Twitter accounts that I've just made up. Long-time listener, Dave Matteo. Uh, if football ended tomorrow, what would take over as your obsession? Uh, does it have to be a sporting one? Let's come in with the ca- caveats right away. Yes, <laughs> but but that's a fair caveat. I'm assuming he means sporting obsession. Oh, yeah. basketball then. Easy. Basketball was my first love. Basketball was what I played high school and college. Basketball is the thing I probably know the most about, even more than soccer. And it's been great watching the bubble. We've been watching this basketball like every night. So it's been a good time. Are they, uh, what's, because I don't, I literally know nothing about American sports. So did the uh, NBA season like, cut short did they manage to finish it what happened so they are currently in the playoffs in the next in the basically the semifinals of the playoffs um so they obviously stopped like every everything else (laughs) um but then when they deemed it was safe enough basically they rented out like an entire hotel and facilities at disney world in florida okay and they're and they're calling it the bubble everyone is like there you're not allowed to go home. You're not allowed to leave. Like you, oh, shit. You are there. They've been going for five, six weeks now, five weeks. Really? It's like an Olympic village. Just Exactly. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly right. That's the same idea. They did not invite every team. Thank <laughs> fuck. The Knicks didn't get invited because they were like, you're garbage and you're not going to do anything <laughs> right, anyway. <okay. laughs> um, but they're up to the playoffs now. LeBron is dominating the playoffs. You've heard of LeBron James, I'm assuming. Yes. Yeah. 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 He's, he's having a... An amazing playoffs at age 37, I think. Oh, there's hope for it's me yet. 17th year in the league. And I think there's a decent chance he'll win the finals MVP the way he's playing. There was this really funny video. They announced the regular season MVP. And like, no one really thought he was going to win it. But he only got 16 out of 101 votes. And the main Instagram account that everyone follows for like basketball stuff is House of Hoops. Or no, House of Highlights. Sorry. And they got a video of him at on the bench, very clearly just like shaking his head and being like, these motherfuckers, 16 <laughs> votes, 16 <laughs> votes. 
I'm gonna <laughs> wow, wow. Okay, watch what happens. And then he oh, love fucking it. dropped like an amazing night that night. And then after the press conference, they asked him about it, and he's like, "Yeah, I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm pissed off." <laughs> Sixteen votes, you guys. Like I'm the, the guy who won it who, probably who deserved to win it. But like, hmm? who votes for that? Sports writers, people in the league. It's it's sort of a right a cross section collection okay. of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What about you? What's your what's your sort of second sport? I honestly don't feel like I've got one. I I sort of I vaguely watch a bit of cricket. I used to like I used to like watching boxing a lot, but that, I must admit a lot of that was I was working at Sky and you I used to get the pay-per-view stuff for free. Uh, I I would not sure I'd want to pay 20 quid for a lot of fights that are over in, you know, 2 minutes. There's a lot of weirdly like uh sports that are quite popular in Peterborough. Again, I've never really bothered with it. We've got like an ice hockey team. Are you an ice hockey guy? Never have been. No, it's. It, I've been told that it's the most like basketball and soccer, but it just watching it on TV, I always lose track of the puck. I don't know. <laughs> it it just has never like I've never been able to get into it. I'm sure I would love it if I did, but yeah, I'm not an ice yeah. hockey guy. No, I've never I've never been into it. But like Peterborough have had a, a team going for years. Peterborough have got a, a speedway team as well. But the f- the first time I went to see that when I was a kid, I. I was excited when I was going, and then I realised when I got there, I thought it was motocross, like uh, oh, biking okay, up the okay, okay. like cool jumps and bumps and stuff, and it was just going round in an oval. I was like, "What the fuck is this?" <laughs> not, not interested at all. We got a greyhound stadium. I I like going to the dogs, but that's not really a sport. That's me sat eating and drinking. Where like, if you go and have a meal, at, well, the Peterborough dog track's gone now. That's a COVID COVID casualty. We've not got a Greyhound Stadium anymore. Yeah. It's gone. But uh, it's a running joke with me and Kel that like, when I was younger um, and had no money, I had no idea how to uh, treat uh, my wife at all. As in, like... <laughs> so I remember one time she came to visit me at uni and I said, uh, oh, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll go out for something to eat tonight. Um, the plan was that the uh, the casino that I used to go to and gamble the money that I didn't have was sure. suddenly deciding to open in afternoons and we're going to put a buffet on. <laughs> so I was oh. like, we're going to go down there and have a free buffet <laughs> while I spend money I can't afford on blackjack. <laughs> no, she still brings that up now, that that was me taking her out for some food. Um, and yet she married you. Yeah, exactly. It's her fault, really, isn't it? It's her fault. Yeah. Um, but we, we went out for a few meals at the... Um, at the Greyhound Stadium, you you get a little booth and you have a meal, and if you eat there, they come and take your bets at the table, so you literally don't even have to move. Like there, there's a bet, there's a race every fifteen minutes, and they come and collect your, uh, take your bets and pay out your winnings at the table. Brilliant. And um, again, we were <laughs> relatively poor. And obviously, we were eating at the Greyhound Stadium for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> like and. Um, we order a bottle of the house wine to go with our meal because I've got no money and it comes and it's got a sticker. The sticker on it has got greyhounds on it. Oh and it boy. just lo- it just looks like it's fucking dog wine. <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> there you go. This is some dog piss in a bowl. <laughs> it's like, mm. And that still gets brought up now <laughs> as well. Rightly again, so. <laughs> With good reason, but yeah. yeah, but they're like, yeah. So greyhound racing, sort of one of the local sports to Peterborough. I'm really not painting Peterborough in a good light. Asbestos. No. <laughs> Are greyhound there any race. asbestos-related sports that you might be able to get into? I don't, well, running across the railway bridge without breathing in is <laughs> a pretty big sport. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't genuinely don't because maybe the the, the glamour of uh, Premier League football takes me out of Peterborough. Yeah, I no don't way. have any other sporting obsession at all. But good question, Dave. Thanks for making me question where I live. Second question from a listener of ours from New Zealand who oh, hey. uh, has said that we said that we're his favourite pod. Wow! Which, I mean, high praise, Blair Williamson. Thank you for that, Blair. Um, what should Chuck's nickname be now? It's no longer Mister One Hundred Percent. I mean, Perfect I did attendance. already start calling him FPL champion this season. So he did uh, win well, twice, right? So, like, we got to give him the credit there. Why, why would you do that to me, Oscar? He's not here. You don't need to... Why? I'm just, I already established that as a precedent. I don't have to keep going with it. We could call him like... Uh, <sighs> no, because it's, it's fine. Resident no, it's hipster like... Chuck Bailey. He'll no. love that. He's not here to defend himself. <laughs> That's so bad. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Well, it's got to be Mr. 99%. I mean, 
I don't know. Just just from a maths point of view, he's well ninety nine point oh nine. Although that just goes up and up as he carries on attending. Right, We've got to exactly, try and make yeah. sure. Yeah, Mister Bleep Machine. <laughs> yeah, true, true. Although I think in the in the intro, I probably got more bleeps than he might have ever got. I know. Yeah. <laughs> him a c- face. Does that work? There you go. That'll do. <laughs> that'll do. That'll do. Uh, right, Chuck. I did a bleep for you. That's, that's it. <laughs> yeah, you don't get many. Two well actually. Two. <laughs> Uh, Sam Danby, Sam Van Danby asks, he, he's trying to give you a bit of needle here. Um, why did anyone think Chelsea would beat Liverpool? I mean, you've already covered that, really. We did spend quite a bit of time talking about that. But he does He does also say, what's it like to support Chelsea in three words? Uh, absolutely fucking wonderful. <laughs> there you go, just universally positive. Yeah, alternatively, full of salt. <laughs> no, that's not right. Savoring that salt. There it is. There it is. You do, you do see the Schadenfreude in you is quite, quite big sometimes. Oh, please, please hate us. Hate us as much as you can, as intensely as you can. That's what Liverpool fans didn't get last year. They were like, oh, man, everyone's picking on us. That's not fair. We're winning our title. We're so good. It's like, bro, if you're doing good things... Other people are going to fucking hate on you. Embrace it. Love it. Learn <laughs> to live in the hate. It is great. <laughs> See, this feels to me like an inherent difference between uh, the north of England and the south of England. Like the north of England is largely seen as friendlier. Like, you know, when if you're a Londoner, and I'm not a Londoner, but I've worked in London for years, and you go up to the north and like anyone will happily like talk to you and you're like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, like I, I, I don't know you, like, but they're inherently, they're friendly. And I think there's maybe a desire to be liked that might be more among Northern clubs rather than especially London clubs who seem to have a, a Chelsea, Arsenal, Millwall, Palace mentality of fuck you guys, we don't care. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Do you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? And I don't know whether that is, I don't know whether I'm right in that. Maybe I'm completely wrong. And people who listen from the north, if there are any left, uh, might want to argue with <laughs> they me. They left so long ago, dude. Yeah, exactly. So long ago. Exactly. But like, yeah, I feel like there might be a, a like Liverpool is such a friendly city. It's such a good night out. It's it it really is a lovely place. And I wonder whether there's just an inherent need to be liked, like that they have, and that they feel that uh, people. Being uh, hating on them is not a good thing. But whereas you revel in it, you absolutely, yeah, absolutely. revel and in I, it. And I'm having a moment of realization, like a fucking therapy session right now, as you say that. And I'm like, oh, it really makes sense that I chose Chelsea then, huh? Because I'm ah. from New York City. <laughs> I grew up a Yankees fan, which is like the most evil sports team in all of America. <laughs> like, especially in the 90s when we were winning title after title after title and like buying trophies like everyone talked. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah, it's yeah, very yeah. much a natural analog. And New York gets a rap for being a rude yeah, city. Absolutely, Everyone's mean in New yeah. York. It's like, no, there's nine million people on one fucking tiny island. I don't have time to say hello to every fucking stranger I walk past <laughs> on the street. Like, you're from a yeah. bumfuck town with seven people. No wonder you talk to everyone you see. Uh, this we guy- have shit to do. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'm busy. Disclaimer, we're not calling Liverpool a bumfuck town with seven people. Uh, I am. Liverpool's a bumfuck town with seven people. No, not, I've never been there. I don't know. Probably, so, it probably sucks. I'm going to assume that it sucks, and I don't need you to tell me otherwise. It really doesn't. You'd love it. I absolutely guarantee you, you'd love it. I don't know, man. I need some good restaurants in my life, and I doubt there's much uh, culinary variety in the city of I Liverpool. Haven't, I haven't eaten a lot in Liverpool. I've been out a few times there, and uh, it's, a, it's a great the city for a night out and they love their music mm, mm. obviously okay. but yeah fair point i haven't i haven't eaten there very often i don't know what the restaurants are like if they haven't got a bottle of dog wine i'm not fucking interested that's how i judge restaurants <laughs> <laughs> anyway so there you go um describe posh in three words what's it like being a posh fan in three words i put you on the spot okay, here. yeah um exciting and i will put put that genuinely because we always seem to like chelsea Win four three, no no no. I'm not. <laughs> Don't count. Those Nineteen I'm words. Up the numbers. Nineteen no, words. I, I think. was saying That's exciting, way too many. and then I was explaining why. <laughs> mm. uh, okay, fine. Um, oh, I was, no. I tell you what. Exciting conveyor belt because we just get players from lower leagues and we sell them on. <laughs> we are just a conveyor belt. 
All so, right. There an you go. exciting conveyor belt. There you go. An exciting conveyor belt. <laughs> I like that. Okay. Uh, Chuck um, wanted to ask a question. This doesn't count for you being on the episode, Chuck, uh, but on a scale Let's be of... Let's very clear about that preemptively clear, before he tries to but... claim it. <laughs> but on a scale of raw to hard-boiled, how embarrassed are you, both of us, after saying Palace would get relegated this season? Hashtag egg on your faces. I think we've got to maybe swallow that one. Uh, I still have them. I would still put them to get relegated if I was making a predictor league today. Would you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. Their numbers are so bad, and Roy doesn't seem to be using the new guys. And even so, their numbers are so bad. To be nice to Chuck, I might put them at like 15th or whatever. But if I was just answering <laughs> honestly, like, do you think Palace are going to get relegated? I would say probably yes, still. I feel like I've got you riled with all the talk of uh, like New York and London. <laughs> you just like you've got into sort of salty Oscar mode. Well, I also haven't eaten since last night because I have a fucking doctor's appointment. Oh, and I of course. Stupidly made my appointment for late in the afternoon, forgetting that I'd have to fast for 12 hours. So I haven't eaten since dinner last night. It's two in the afternoon. So I'm like fucking hangry. But I would still put Palace to get relegated. I'm not going like, <laughs> to pretend that I wouldn't. That's not just the hunger talking. Yeah. I'm not sure I would anymore, I must admit. But I, I I feel like there's a lot of things that are maybe a bit iffy in my predictor league. But we got them in so quickly because uh, Chuck demands that we get them in quickly. And I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, yeah. I'll, I'll accept a bit of egg, Chuck. I'll accept a bit of egg. Um, I don't like eggs anyway, so perfect. Not an egg man. No. Not an egg man. <laughs> um, so yeah, fair enough, Chuck. I'll uh, I'll take that one on the chin. I probably wouldn't put them to get relegated in the minute, but there's a lot of things I'll make different in my predictor league. Uh, so that wraps up the listener questions. Um, you can get us on Miles Offside Pod on Twitter. Uh, we're on Facebook as Miles Offside. You can email us milesoffsidepod at gmail dot com uh, if you've got something longer to send us dick pics that sort of thing. Stories about pooping in emu planes. Yeah. Throwback yeah. to like episode four. Oh, or yeah. When we got, yeah. When we asked for embarrassing stories to be emailed to us. And that's <laughs> Darren, Darren Anthony Hoy of emu planes really, really came through. And his name is burned in my memory because yeah, of that story. Apparently. <laughs> yeah. I genuinely, I'll I never forget I still think that. it's a fake name and it's Dave. It's I'm Dave Mateo. Saying. Yeah. Yeah. It's Dave Mateo. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so, um, in, in lieu of Chuck being here, why don't you, um, take us through the fixtures for this week okay sounds good uh starting off with saturday 7 30 a.m on the east coast 4 30 a.m on the west coast noon 30 in the uk <laughs> and 9 30 p.m in melbourne australia we have brighton <laughs> versus manchester united uh continuing on the saturday we have palace everton west brom chelsea and burnley southampton do any of those stand out for saturday to you I think Chelsea should should be well placed to give West Brom a dick in. Um, I think Palace might come crashing down to earth if Everton are playing well. I think Brighton Man U, just because Brighton played well against you guys, they uh, destroyed Newcastle. Tarek Lamptey looks absolutely stunning mm-hmm. as a player. I he think really he, does. I'll be surprised if he's still playing for Brighton next season. Um, I, I caught some of Brighton. I know we didn't talk about it, but... Um, Brighton Newcastle uh, they did like at half time they did like a highlights reel of Lamptey and you'd be proud of that if it was at full time like he yeah it, it really does look something else he's um, going to be one of those former Chelsea players that has a very very excellent career after he leaves us and I don't think he could like I wouldn't pick him over Reese James no so I think it makes sense that he's out but yeah. like He's so fucking good. Yeah, so. really good. And yeah, I mean, Man United will be low on confidence and Brighton will be high. I mean, that might be a good game. Sorry, Chuck, to say that Brighton might give Man United a game just like Palace did. But yeah, that might that might actually be a good opener. Absolutely. Worth waking up for the 4.30 if you're on the West Coast, probably. <laughs> Sunday, September 27th, 2020, 7 a.m., Sheffield United versus Leeds, 9 a.m., Spurs versus Newcastle, Manchester City versus Leicester at 11.30 a.m., and West Ham, sorry, Westham versus Wolves <laughs> at 14 o'clock, West which them. is 2 p.m. on the East Coast. I'm giving these an East Coast times. <laughs> Everyone else figure it out. Do the math. I have to do the math every week. So yeah. whatever. Let's see. I guess City Leicester, right? For that day? Yeah. I mean, that's interesting just because I think it's a, it's another team that you would expect to give Man City a game. You know, it's sort of similar level to Wolves. So, yeah, it'd be good to see if they can keep it up. Um, Sheffield United Leeds might be interesting uh, just to 
you know, have two interesting systems play against each other. But yeah, it's, uh, that, those are probably the I don't know, Spurs, Newcastle. I could, I could see that going either way, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, Newcastle are trash, but Spurs are mid-table, so like, you never know what could happen. <laughs> um, and let's go on to Monday. We have the big fixture for the week. <laughs> That's right. It's Fulham versus Aston Villa at 13 p.m., a.k.a. 1 p.m. East Coast time on NBC Peacock. Fuck you, NBC. Thanks for that. And Liverpool versus Arsenal at 15.15, which is 3.15 p.m. East Coast. Liverpool, Arsenal? Liverpool's going to dick them, right? I would have thought so. It's, It's Arsenal's first proper challenge. I mean, they've only had Fulham and West Ham. So, yeah, it's Arsenal's first uh, proper challenge since everyone's saying they're they're a, a new force to be reckoned with, which I frankly don't agree with until you've played someone decent. So let's see, let's see how they do on the Monday night football. Um, yeah, I would have thought Liverpool should have enough to deal with them, no problem. So that will be Liverpool on nine points from uh, nine if they win that. Yeah, ugh, I guess I'm rooting for Arsenal. <laughs> Fuck man. Well, that's the thing. Like, if Liverpool win that, it's you know it's points on the board, isn't it? I mean, I know Man City have got a game. I know Man City have got a game in hand, but. Yeah, I fancy Liverpool to win that. And then you sort of think, oh, blimey, it's becoming, you know, nine points from nine. They got off to a good start last year and that was that was kind of, it all went from there. Well, they got off to a good start last year, even though their defence started badly. And I don't think you can count the Chelsea game because of what happened with the red card and that. So it'll be interesting to see if Arsenal can uh, get any re- attacking returns. But yeah, I'm, I think money's got to be on Liverpool for that. So yeah, we'll see. All right. And that wraps us up for the week. So thank you for joining us. Absolute delight to be on with you, Mr. Stimson. As you, always. And uh, thanks to uh, Nate Witt. And we need to thank Nate because he's uh, a producer-level Patreon of the pod. We sometimes forget to do that. So sorry, Nate. But thank you, Nate. Yeah, and an excellent, excellent human being. So that also exactly. for me. Well, of course he is. Yeah, they all are. Next week, we'll be back with the full squad. Chuckle, I'm sure we'll have many things to say Opinions. about all the things that we said. <laughs> but thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Say bye, Ian. Bye. And that's a goodbye from me. <laughs>